Please join me in welcoming our panelists for Applying Big Data to Real World Challenges, the case of FinTech. Joteka Edi, Head of Government Affairs at LendUp, Iram Musharraf, Director of Impact and Analytics at Proactive Incorporated, Ramona Ortega, CEO of My Money, My Future Incorporated, Jennifer Tesher, President and CEO at the Center for Financial Services Innovation, and our moderator, Nikitra Bailey, Executive Vice President at the Center for Responsible Lending. technology, right? And, and, and that's why we're here talking about technology. <laughs> I am Nikitra Bailey, an Executive Vice President with the Center for Responsible Lending. My organization is a research and policy advocacy organization that's dedicated to ending abusive financial services and ensuring that the financial marketplace is fair and transparent. We have a remarkable set of panelists today, and we're going to engage in a very important conversation around FinTech and what it means to apply big data um, to this to this new opportunity of innovation in the financial services sector. So with that, let us uh, go ahead and move things along. Just because I'm using technology, it wants to have fun with us. So I will start by introducing our panelists. So first we have Iram Musharraf, who's with us today. who's with us today as the Director of Impacts and Analytics from PayActive. We also have Ramona Ortega, who's with us today from My Money, My Future. And also we have Jennifer Tesher, who's the President and CEO of the Center for Financial Services Innovation. And we also have Jotaka Edie, who's with us as the head of, head of Government Affairs from Linda. So to get us started, we'll allow our panelists to introduce themselves quickly with kind of a 30-second intro to the audience, and then we'll, we'll jump right in. Why don't we start with Carol? Okay. Thank you so much. Nice to be here this morning with all of you. Um, so PayActive is a financial wellness solution. We work with employers to provide their income, um, employees with access to their earned income. So instead of having to wait two weeks for your paycheck, what we do is we provide employers with a tool so that they can enable their employees to access their funds as they need it. Um, my Money, My Future, please go and download it for all the millennials in the room. That's mymoneymyfuture.co. We are a personal financial advisor for millennials of color. What does that mean? We help people make smarter financial decisions. Um, and we speak to millennials of color in a way that really understands their experience. Um, so that's sort of what we do. We'll get back into sort of how I got into tech in a little bit. All right, Jennifer. Hi, everybody. So nice to be here this morning. Uh, the Center for Financial Services Innovation is really focused on promoting financial health in America. Uh, we think about financial health as uh, when you have a day-to-day -day system that enables you to build resilience and pursue opportunity. Uh, and obviously, uh, financial services uh, is a really big part of that day-to-day -day system. Uh, and uh, we believe that technology has a very important role to play um, in helping Americans better 
uh, manage their financial lives and ultimately improve their financial health over time. Good morning, everyone. My name is Jotaka Eady, and I'm with LendUp. And LendUp, we are a socially responsible lender uh, based in California with the mission to redefine financial services for the 56% of Americans shut out of mainstream banking or impacted by income volatility. And what does that mean? So we build, uh, we, we build technology and financial products and educational experiences for those Americans. And uh, our first product was an alternative to payday loans. It was called the Lend Up Ladder. And what we focus on is how do we actually use technology and innovation um, and combine that with education to provide access to credit, but also uh, enable our consumers to increase uh, their credit scores and also expand their financial health and wealth. Great. So, so let's kind of kick this conversation off where the last panel ended, right? So we, we heard a lot about how algorithms and big data can really drive us forward um, in, in, in the technology space. What can we do um, in the financial services sector um, to ensure that um, underserved borrowers are, are getting access in a way that's helpful um, for them in their development? I mean, what we can do is design for the underserved sector. What's been happening up until now is that big finance firms are not catering to this audience. Big finance firms go to where the capital lies, and the capital is not in the hands of the underserved. Um, so they're not designing for them. So what we can do as a first step is actually, you know, before even getting to the point of building algorithms is listen to the end user, understand their problems, and even in terms of prototyping, the way PayActive has approached um, our market is to go in, you know, prototype initially, and then understand and get feedback um, and do surveys. Actually, I do a lot of primary research with our users, so direct interviews, et cetera. A lot of that listening is what's translated eventually into um, how uh, our product is played out. So, so to me, you know, as a first step, that's really how you can use it. You can collect the right data. <laughs> Um, and then design with that empathy in mind for the underserved. Absolutely. I think empathy is a really big key um, thing here because, you know, I say, I'll say working class people and people of color have 99 problems and the app is not one of them. Mm -hmm. It's not that the apps don't exist. It's they're not being targeted or marketed in a way that makes sense for them to access it. People don't buy what they don't know. So we have to start with meeting people where they are in a sort of a culturally relevant context. So our company's mission-based company. We are um, really out to help close the racial wealth gap. And one of the things that we identified was that there was no one in the market, especially in the fintech market, which is predominantly dominated by young white men. Um, if you look at all of the sort of top 100 fintech companies, there's, there's almost no women of color. I, I don't even know if there is a woman of color in the top 100. Oh. <laughs> but in terms of venture, I mean, if you look at the, CB, if you look at the CB Insights, yeah. for example. Um, so, uh, saying that though, that there's so few of us out there in terms of targeting a very specific market segment, and that's what makes us different is that it's about how you sell the product and how you help people achieve um, building wealth, right? And so for us, building wealth is not just about sort of budgeting and being able to pay your bills, but actually how do you accumulate assets over time, right? That includes insurance, budgeting, and uh, retirement. And so by figuring out sort of those data points, we already know a lot of the data in terms of where they're at. So it's figuring out the solutions, like how do we get folks to a better place over time? And it, I think just to add into the, this point, the reality is that you know, this is unfortunately a growing population. So I, I think it's more than just, you know, how can FinTech just service this community, but how can actually FinTech be a part of actually, you know, really empowering this community to actually move out of this population, this segmentation that's happening in our country and move into better financial health. I, I mean, you know, Lisa Servan's uh, book, uh, The Unbanking of America, she calls it the new emerging uh, middle class. And I think the reality is that in our country, the American workforce, you know, people have gone from having careers to jobs to now tasks. Um, and there's just a whole lot of income volatility, expense volatility, which is resulting in uh, really a rise 
uh, in, in the fact that there are far too many Americans in our country that don't even have the ability uh, in an emergency of $400. Um, and so that's a, a real reality. And so I think it's far more than just how can FinTech and, and these algorithms or whatever, how can it just service, but also how can it really empower to move people out um, and really be a bridge? Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more with the excellent comments. Uh, I knew I was going to enjoy this panel. Um, <laughs> and I think, um, uh, maybe the last thing to add to tie these thoughts together is the idea of how can we influence this next generation of entrepreneurs to actually care about solving real consumer challenges and per in particular consumer challenges among um, um, uh, dispor disproportionately underrepresented uh, uh, communities. Uh, through our Financial Solutions Lab, uh, which is a partnership with J.P. Morgan Chase, uh, we try to uh, encourage that next generation of entrepreneurs to actually build businesses that solve real problems instead of the, I can, order, I can ha build an app to order cookies at 2 in the morning uh, or whatever else, right? How do I really build a business that change, changes lives? Because not only is that uh, the right thing to do, that's actually where ultimately the money is going to be made. Um, that's where the opportunities lie uh, in the long term. And so I think that it's about um, providing incentives and guidance to make sure that those entrepreneurs um, actually understand the challenges. So uh, having empathy, listening, but also uh, uh, to her point earlier, like uh, you know, the average entrepreneur in Silicon Valley is a young white guy um, who mm -hmm. even with the best of intentions uh, may not have that lived experience uh, and needs to be exposed. Um, and so um, through the Financial Solutions Lab, we try to do all of those things to both uh, encourage folks to focus on the right problems, make sure they get the exposure that they need, um, and then also make sure that they're designing with high quality in mind because you know, innovation is just a thing. It's not good or bad. In fact, it's, it's both. It's often good and bad. <laughs> Uh, and so it's not enough to get people focused on this market. It's also making sure that they're building uh, ex products and experiences that are actually going to help people as opposed to hurt them. So, so, so that's a really good place to, to really think about um, what's going on in the financial marketplace. One of the points that we were talking about back in the green room was that FinTech could, in many ways, it could empower communities, but it also really just brings more access, right? And some of that access might not be helpful and useful in communities. So how do we respond to this conversation point around how we're just bringing more financial resources in communities in a way that doesn't really help empower them in terms of doing things like building assets and reaching sustainable home ownership? How do we, um, how do we respond to that, um, that, that point? Ramona. Yeah, I actually. <laughs> so there's, I mean, for those of you who, who know fintech, there's many verticals, right? So one of the verticals is lending, micro lending, lending to low income, lending of all sorts, which is basically how do we get more loans out to low income folks. Now, I'm of the sort of opinion that I'm not sure we need more loans to low income folks when we need higher wages, right? So from a structural mm -hmm. Uh, point of view, I think that I, we need to be careful about that. The other piece is that there's a lot of sort of feature apps, right? Automated savings, automated this, so it's sort of set and forget, which is not changing behavior, right? It's changing sort of the, the way you just don't think about it. We want to, in terms of what we're doing with our platform, we really actually want to empower people to change the behavior, right? And so there's things like automation that we build in as features to our platform and that other people can build in that are really important for efficiency-wise, and especially for millennials. Yeah, there are things that you don't want to have to do on a daily basis. But at the end of the day, what we need to do is empower people around finance, particularly since finance has been sort of the domain of white men. I come out of finance from Wall Street. It was no different there. As an attorney on Wall Street, there was no different there. The partners were white. They were men. People that think about finance, that's what we think about. When we're trying to change the face of finance, which is what we're trying to do, then we're saying, I want young people of color to be just empowered about their retirement or investment or budgeting as anyone else because they care about that just as much as anyone else. And if you think about it, we need to have folks of color at the table creating these solutions because this is our experience. We know what products people need because we're in it. And so I think that to the point of like, you need to start 
if, when you start funding women of color or, or people of color or people that come from low-income communities to build the products, you get better solutions. So we're, we're, more, we're totally on the same page as far as we don't need more lending. We do not need more loans. We tend to have, we have a perspective that we, if we continue at the rate that we're growing and the numbers are there, uh, we are going to be at the brink of another consumer finance crisis. This time it'll be a loan crisis of the, the low income individual that has just got um, too much debt. So we, I mean, the entire model that we've built around is to move away. Many times I think the word that's confused is um, uh, credit uh, as opposed to access to, to cash. So it doesn't have to be just a loan in order to get people the access to funds they need at the right time. So going back to Ramona's point, um, yes, it's about the level of pay. That is a policy issue. Should we raise minimum wage? Or it's about the structure of pay, which these are... Generally, the pay debate tends to be around these two. What the role that Pay Active and the innovation that we're bringing in is, we're adding in this element of time within this debate of, of pay. And by time, what we mean is giving people access to the income they've already earned at the right time can sometimes prevent them from falling into the entire world of debt spirals. And, and just seeing how much you've earned on a daily basis or you know, on a weekly basis through an app gives you just the ability to, to make uh, manage your income expenses better. So the space that we're playing in is that, to try to steer away from lending and managing day to day. Yeah, I think uh, just to jump in in terms as a, a company that does lend, I, I think the reality is that there is a, th there's a lot when you look at what's offered to uh, particularly those that are a part of this 56% shut out of mainstream banking is that there are a lot of lending products. And so yeah. what... Let, let, let me ask you that question so. because like so... On one hand, you say that there's 56% of Americans shut out of mainstream banking, but then on the other hand, when we get reports from the FDIC, we hear that 93% of all Americans are banked. Help us appreciate that nuance. Mm. So I, I think the, the, the reality is that, yes, there are a lot of folks that are banked. They have bank accounts or they have some relationship with banks, but then there is a, you know, a great number of Americans who they go into that bank, they you know, will apply for... Uh, a loan product and they cannot access that loan product and, and often it's because of, of credit score and so I think even like when we think about lending I think we have to redefine and rethink and I know the CFPB has this conversation right now about alternative data and, and we certainly at LendUp believe that you know there's wider data you know that is FCRA FICRA compliant data that that we can be, begin to use and we use some of that data public records uh, that you're able to, you know, uh, partnering with tech companies to look at bank history data uh, and other, you know, uh, information that that we can look from traditional and non-traditional uh, CRAs for that data. But the reality is that, you know, uh, and and I have conversations. I spent most of my career uh, as, you know, in advocacy. You know, I was at the NAACP, and 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 the reality is that there are many customers uh, that we have. Uh, and we interview and we, we talk to our customers and we ask our customers, you know, if you had a choice between $100 or a 50 point increase in your credit score, 90% of them say they want a 50 point increase in their credit score. Because the reality is that if your credit score is below 650, on average, you're going to spend $250,000 in over your lifetime in fees. And, and I always quote John Hope Bryan, and he says, nothing in your life you know, has so much impact as one, the love of God and a hundred point increase in your credit score. And, and that's a real and, reality. And credit scores. <laughs> it's real. And credit scores actually reflect historical wealth and equity, right? Like we didn't get to this gap in credit scoring accidentally, right? Yes. Like we made mm -hmm. a decision as a nation that we would make investment in certain communities. Those communities didn't happen to be communities of color or rural communities or, mm -hmm. you know, women headed households. So in many ways, this, this history of kind of disparity in credit scoring really is something um, that has to be addressed from a, a wealth equity um, space. So Jennifer, why don't, you, why don't you talk a little bit about kind of this question around whether or not fintech will really replace traditional banking, right? There's this scare right now that, you know, these fintech firms will come along and they will drive out mainstream banking. Is that a, a legitimate threat that banks should be concerned about? Um, the short answer is no. Um, I think that a few years ago, that was more the storyline, and um, the media, and I'm, uh, you know, a long time ago, a former reporter, likes a good uh, us versus them, uh, and it was sort of a fight to the death. Who will own the customer? 
And I think what everyone has realized is that it's the combination of those two parts of uh, the industry that are where the interesting stuff is happening, the mashup between the two. Um, uh, banks play a very important role in this country. Um, they play a very important role at a minimum around providing a whole set of infrastructure. Um, and many fintech providers um, uh, may make a better front door for a lot of consumer markets, particularly the ones we care about. Um, I t totally agree with the issue that it's, it's often not about product, it's about marketing and speaking to folks in their language, literally and figuratively. Uh, and so I think we're starting to see all kinds of interesting connections and combinations, uh, banks partnering with, uh, banks buying, uh, banks investing in, banks opening labs uh, to help bring up uh, fintech companies. Um, now, if I want to play this out maybe 10 plus years from now, um, if I were a very large bank, the folks I would be most concerned about uh, would be you know, the big four, uh, Google, Amazon, um, uh, Apple, Facebook. Um, I think that those companies rival the very largest banks in terms of their scale and their reach and their, um, frankly, their capital base to be able to draw from to innovate. Um, but I think what those large firms have that many of the largest banks don't have is they are so intertwined and integrated into all of our day-to-day -day lives um, uh, in a way that our banks just aren't. Despite banks having a heck of a lot of data about us, those other companies I mentioned have way more. Uh, and, and, and in many ways, they have already impacted the space, right? Like some of the things that Google and Facebook have done. I see our friend uh, Chanel Hardy is here from Google. Like they've really decided what kind of financial services practices they will actually allow to advertise on their platform. So we know that last year they made a decision to not allow payday lenders to have access in their space. Correct, correct. And so I actually think there's a lot to be said for having financial services not be the core way you make money. Uh, but have it be the, the thing that facilitates the thing you're trying to do mm -hmm. because it ends up, uh, uh, it provides the opportunity to think differently about how you price. So I'll use Walmart as an example, right? When Walmart went into financial services several years ago, that was the other, that was the 10 years ago, oh, banks are going out of business, here comes Walmart. But the fact is, if Walmart can uh, take a, um, uh, can generate higher same store sales, by offering financial services in their stores, they're willing to take a haircut on what they charge for those financial services. Uh, and I think that uh, uh, Facebook and Google and the rest really have that same opportunity. Okay, Aram, take us to the conversation right before this panel when we were talking about how we can ensure like discriminatory practices don't manifest themselves through algorithms. What mm -hmm. can happen in this space to ensure that that's not taking place? Yeah, well, I mean, the example of FICO scores is just one right there. It's, we have 108 million people that are subprime or no credit. So clearly there is some lack of uh, inclusion there coming right out of an algorithm. So what are the ways that you can, you can fix that? Um, a lot of thinking has to be done about stakeholders. Who are the stakeholders? Credit scores, et cetera, are used by banks to, to lend. Um, there's policymakers that are trying to solve the inclusion problem from a different lens. And I think the role of fintech, and you know, that's where we can come in, is to come and look at all of the stakeholders and see what each stakeholder can do. Um, something that we've very consciously done is we have chosen to work with employers. Um, employers are the source of payment for their low-income workers. It's because of the way payroll has been the archaic, actually, what we call archaic payroll systems that keep, they pay everyone else. They pay every vendor, is paid on time. The example we often use is of a juice shop. The consumer pays the owner, the owner passes on the juice, they buy their fruit, everything, everyone's paid, but the employee is waiting two weeks to get their paycheck. And while they're waiting, in the meanwhile, they're not able to put milk in the fridge, they've given out lump sum payments. These are part of our fa findings that after rent payment, invariably, low-income workers are struggling to get to the next paycheck, and that is when they're going out and borrowing. So we're saying, give them access to the funds they're earning daily, they can get what they need. The scarcity mindset is going to, is what, it, there's a lot of distress and tension around just because of scarcity. So that's what we're approaching it from, is bring the stakeholder, the employer as a stakeholder, they're a part of the problem. 
And, and, and Ramona, help us, help us appreciate, like, what can fintech firms actually do to build confidence in, with consumers and, and to, to really gain trust, right? Like, so first the question is, do, do consumers even trust fintech companies? And if, and if they do, you know, why is that? And then if they don't, what can fintech companies actually do to really gain consumer confidence? Sure, I think it depends on the segment. I mean, so we, we're focused on, on the millennial segment, and, and I'll, I'll tell you why, because in communities of color in particular, the millennials, which are the sort of the children of, of the baby boomers, are the ones that are gonna be helping their parents also navigate the new financial systems. We're also going to have the first generation of massive wealth transfer, and those young folks are not necessarily prepared to figure out how to invest that and make that work for them, right? So. A part of this is about authenticity, and I and I and I say that because people trust when they have they feel like there's an authentic sort of mission behind your company. They feel like you're authentic, that you're an advocate, and I think that is really important. And this is why big banks are often thought of as sort of like the enemy, right? They're not authentic. They know consumers know, especially after all of the the drama that we've had in the last decade, that 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 bank doesn't necessarily have your back. And I think that if fintech wants to make a difference in terms of bridging that gap between financial institutions, which I think, because eventually FinTech is just gonna be working with big financial institutions. We have to figure out a way then to be, FinTech players have to be able to connect with our users, connect with our segments, and bring that voice of authenticity. Um, so we often say that we're your financial advocate, right? So we're helping you make smarter decisions as they come up. Uh, if you're not getting financial education at home, which most, uh, most folks of color are not, then you're not getting it in school, you're not getting it, and you're making these mistakes that are costly over time, right? And so by helping people understand their decisions, then we can then later sell the product if they need it. And I think that's the key thing. It's about wealth building, right? And we know structurally that we are hundreds of years behind, literally hundreds of years behind. Um, so how do we get young people to start thinking about that um, in a way that's very authentic to where they are and reflects their experience? And just to, and, and, just and, to build and, on that real quick, um, it goes back to this idea that the solution here isn't just yet another new product. It's about the experience. It's about how people engage and how we engage them. And so I think what a lot of, uh, of the more successful fintech uh, companies are doing is even the way they talk to, meaning in text on your phone, the tone they use, the language they use, adding humor to the experience, um, uh, uh, I think makes a huge difference, mm -hmm. even though it's something relatively small. It has nothing to do with the product itself. Uh, and um, uh, we talk a lot about this issue of tech versus touch. Mm -hmm. Don't people still need human interaction? I absolutely think they do. And I think that's an important discussion to have when we're talking about big data and algorithms in particular. But what's so interesting about one of the things technology can do is in certain instances, it actually can um, not replace but mimic to a strong degree uh, the feeling that you get from having personal interaction. Uh, and I think that is so important in this moment of increasing depersonalization. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and I think it's one of the things that makes FinTech so successful. And, and Joteka, kind of speaking about consumer confidences, we know that Lindup just had uh, enforcement action taken against it by the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, mm -hmm. where the bureau found that it wasn't really offering um, the services that it promised of helping borrowers increase credit scores. So the bureau fined uh, Lindup about $1.8 million and uh, redistributed those uh, monies to about 50,000 consumers. So. What can Lindup learn and what can other technology companies learn from that enforcement action to actually do exactly what it is Jennifer just talked about? You know, th thank you for that question. And, you know, so just to further just share, so, so that enforcement action was reflected of a review that the company had uh, at the very beginning of the company. Um, not an excuse, uh, but just to put it in context, you know, that review happened I think Lindup had as few as five employees at the time, as at the very beginning of the company. Uh, we're five years old, and since we, we've grown, uh, we've learned a lot. And I think the most important lesson, and I think it's a lesson that we share with all of our partners in fintech. I mean, we actually, you know, you meet anyone in our company, particularly our leadership, and they say you have to have compliance, uh, you know, has to be, you know, number one at the very beginning. And I think that was an important lesson for our company. 
Um, and, and really that enforcement action, I think for us was really, um, you know, it was a hard uh, lesson, but it was a lesson uh, that we appreciated because we are a company that is a mission company. If you look at the founders of our company, you know, we were founded by people who is a, a great mix of former government uh, employees, former financial services, some of the most brilliant technologists, um, all committed to a mission of how do we actually redefine financial services. We've since gone on um, to have you know, data to prove that number one, uh, fully uh, expanded compliance and legal. Uh, we have more compliance and legal staff than we did at the time of that review. Um, and also gone on to save our customers $60 million in fees. Um, we did a study with TransUnion, which came back and showed that there's a 62% likelihood that if you are borrowing with LendUp, you, have, you will have a 50-point uh, credit score increase. And we've delivered 1.2 million uh, financial education courses. So for us, it was a hard lesson. It was a real lesson. But I think you know, for the greater FinTech uh, community is that compliance is absolutely imperative and it's important. Um, and whether you're a mission company or you don't have a mission, that's important and that was the lesson for us. And, and thank you for that point because that, that really is going to bring us to kind of a close of this moderator portion. We're going to now move out um, to the audience and, and draw questions from you. But that, that's a really important place for us to end, right? So from a consumer perspective, um, consumer advocacy perspective, right? Like we believe that this innovation is really great, right? Like we're at this opportunity where we could really do some unique things and really help bring people who have been traditionally left behind in the financial services sector inward and, and, and more engage, but we think that that adequate consumer protection um, is necessary, and not just at the federal level, right? Like, it's important that we're complying with state consumer protection laws as well. And, and I want to kind of put fully on now my advocacy hat. There is this uh, effort being taken now by the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency, where it's trying to make a determination as to whether or not it could grant new FinCheck fintech charters, um, which would really allow fintech companies to operate in spaces as non-banks and have the kind of umbrella of a national bank so that they could operate in different spaces and carry usury rates across borders. And we're opposed to that with over 250 other organizations representing state policy advocates, consumer uh, advocates here in DC and national civil rights organizations. And our, our chief concern is that we don't want to return to the trouble that we had that led to the Great Recession. Right? Right? Like, we know that adequate regulation is not only good for consumers, it's good for the overall economy. One of the things that happened during the financial crisis when all of um, our communities were impacted by foreclosure, even those of us who did not have our homes foreclosed upon, we suffered the ramifications of that. Like, we all experienced decrease in home values. So we're going to make sure in this space where, where we have this opportunity for innovation and, and engagement um, that we do it in a way that's responsible um, for, for the whole of, of all of us. So let's move at this point to, to audience Q&A. Through all these ideas, and I have two questions. Um, Jennifer and for Ramona, I'm interested in hearing more about the laboratory approach and from the bank's perspectives, what are they? They are people you're engaged with, with pushing out access and engagement. What is their perspective about you? What do they think of you? <laughs> and particularly Jennifer and Ramona. Who, who, who's the we? Uh, or who's the, what, who's the they in the what do they think about you? The bank. Okay. I mean, so we do have, we're um, sort of using also a B2B model working with banks because we do think that credit unions particularly and community banks have a real opportunity to reach out to a new generation. They don't have that tech built in. They're not agile. They can't move as quickly and they definitely don't have the content marketing that we offer. So as a B2B platform, we've been working um, and entering that market to partner with them, um, especially community banks and credit unions who we really believe that have uh, sort of more of a consumer advocacy feel. Um, so that's sort of how we work with them. I, we don't see them as the enemy. I mean, at the end of the day, 
all of these fintech companies will have their foot or some link to a traditional financial institution, whether that's insurance, lending, I mean, all of them have some partnership in some way with financial institutions, they're not going away. Um, so it's how do we enable them to either reach a market or to sort of be a bridge and to be sort of a advocate in that bridge. Right. Um, so we think that there's an important role for a wide variety of actors in the marketplace. And again, I, what I said earlier, it's the mashup that I think is where the most interesting stuff is happening. And so we actually lead a network of uh, over 120 financial services and fintech companies who are really uh, focused on trying to build the financial health marketplace of the future. And one of the reasons that they participate is because of the opportunity to engage with each other. Uh, so um, I, would also, I would also say that our financial solutions lab, which is where we're investing in this next generation of entrepreneurs, is primarily funded by a bank. Um, and in fact, many banks are looking to take their own capital um, and invest in the same marketplace, both because they want to get under the hood, they want to see what's going on, they might see it as an M&A opportunity in the future. Uh, so I think that uh, this is a very dynamic time in the broader financial services industry. Uh, it's, it's a very exciting time. Next question, towards the back, right? near the monitor. Thank you. Um, this question, I'm going to direct it a little bit more at Ramona, but all the panels invited to respond. Um, I think we've noticed that um, the traditional mainstream banks have failed to really um, meet the needs of underserved communities and people of color, and especially for Latinos. Um, Ramona, how do you see Latinos identifying and finding ways to get their financial services met and um, how will FinTech play a role in that? And for all of the panel, do you see communities creating their own financial services, either establishing their own banks through CDFIs or credit unions? Um, mm -hmm. We'd just like to get your insights on that. So very quickly, yeah, we started initially targeting just primarily the Latino community um, and then pivoted to sort of a multicultural millennial. Um, and the idea is that we both face the same structural um, and racial wealth gaps. So we have the same issues in our community, which is it's not that banks aren't necessarily in our community. They've been selling us products. They've just been selling us the wrong products, right? <laughs> the products that they're selling us are bad mortgages and, and overextension of credit, right? So it's not, it, so, so, the, so the issue is, how do we help people build wealth, right? Which is, it's not just about being banked. So I'm also like, I'm not, people have bank accounts. Poor folks have bank accounts, it's not that. We need to get them to start building wealth and how do we do that? And so part of it is that we know that millennials of color are over indexed on all digital platforms. Yep. So all you millennials of color out there made Snap, Snapchat IPO successful. Are you part of that company? No. Right, and so the idea is like, how do we start creating our own innovation in our community so that we also can benefit from that, right? Which is why I'm, you know, it's all about empowering young folks because we also, as communities of color, have two trillion dollars of buying power. It's just that that buying power is not equating wealth in our community. So how do we make that transfer, right? Which is we have to start earlier than later, right? Because by the time that we understand the system, we're like in our 30s and we're like, oh my God, I have nothing in retirement, right? So what would I have told my 20-year-old self? Credit, invest. It's not how much you invest, it's how long you invest. It's not that complicated. And so that's, I think, what we're doing is really trying to meet folks where they are on social media, live events, partnering with institutions that are already on the ground and trusted, and I think that's the best way to reach people, is to really partner with those institutions, organizations, nonprofits, churches, the whole, the whole nine. Uh, just to, to add into to, to your question, in, in terms of the question of, of, of banks, it, it, the, the reality is that unfortunately, particularly in large communities of color or co communities, um, you know, we're seeing less and less banks. Banks are moving out. It's banking okay. deserts now. Um, and people are turning to, you know, payday lenders, uh, checking the cash. Uh, and so I think there's a real opportunity. And so when we look at, uh, you know, when you look at LendUp's model, like our goal 
is not to ever take a customer away from a credit union or a bank. You know, our goal is to take customers who are going into, you know, the payday lender store, you know, in their community or the check in the cash and providing them with a better product that can give them more credit, uh, lower their rates, uh, provide financial education, help raise their credit scores and, you know, get them prepared uh, and help empower them to get into, you know, community uh, banks and to credit unions. Um, and so we, you know, advocate and we think that we need more CDFIs, we need more credit unions, um, and we want to partner with those credit unions and, and, and those institutions because I think it's going to take, you know, a multitude of, of stakeholders, policymakers, fintech, banks, responsible lending, all of that really to really solve the problem. And I think we're seeing particularly for the Latino community, I think Opportune and their other you know, uh, fintech uh, companies that are emerging that are really focusing on providing uh, financial services where there has been a real desert uh, from banking institutions. And, and I think we, we, we have to have a level of accountability for banks, right? Like, so, so part of what the benefit for banks are is that they get federally insured deposits, right? So, so we also have to have more rigorous enforcement of our Community Reinvestment Act, right? Mm -hmm. and, and we've got to ensure that we're thinking about CRA in a very modernized yeah. way. Like, traditionally, mm -hmm. we're looking at it in terms of home lending, but we've got to make sure we're looking at it in terms of consumer credit. And mm -hmm. we're also now going to really have to be responsible to make sure we're thinking about it in terms of small business lending. because. One of the mm -hmm. things that FinTech yeah. does really well is it really helps small businesses access resources as, as well. Mm -hmm. So we have another question. Hi, my name is Linda Berge, Paper Crane Funding Solutions. We help communities raise money. I'm wondering if you're working with, um, if you're partnering with foundations around impact investing. The Ford Foundation has committed $1 billion to mission-related investments, and a lot of that is going to go to entrepreneurs and uh, community-based uh, community development. So, so the, the organization that I'm affiliated with, the Center for Responsible Lending, is affiliated with the National Credit Union, Self-Help Credit Union, and for over 30 years, Self-Help has actually been providing the very type of investing um, that you're, you're talking about. We've invested in over, um, you know, communities in, in, in over six and a half billion dollars of investment in communities um, to small businesses, um, to nonprofits, and to individuals um, so that they could obtain home ownership. I, I would, um, we're, we're focused on impact and investing, both because we invest, but actually from a very different lens, which is um, how do you measure impact? So uh, we've spent the last three years developing a framework around financial health, a definition, a set of indicators and metrics. Um, and we think that not, not in every case, but in many cases, some of those financial health indicators might be very useful uh, either screening mechanisms to help decide where you want to invest or back end uh, 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 metrics for success, for measuring impact. Um, particularly as you think about impact investing really broadening and now some of the largest uh, asset managers, BlackRock and others, really digging in and looking for uh, data uh, so they can find uh, the value. Um, I think there's a really interesting opportunity as it, as it relates to ESG screens in particular. Um, the S, society, is largely about how employers treat their workforce, um, and those are relatively um, outdated in our minds uh, measures given the nature of how uh, work has changed. Uh, and so there in particular, we think that uh, there may be room to think differently about those indicators uh, and, th and we think that uh, employers and lots of other uh, arenas should care about the financial health of their clients, workers, patients, uh, students, uh, and so uh, that's how we're approaching the issue. And, so, um, and, and, and with that point, unfortunately, we're bringing this lovely discussion to a close. Um, but, 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 it, but as you all know, we can continue to talk to one another through technology. So let's continue the conversation <laughs> through um, the hashtag for the conference. Thank you. Join me in. Thank you.